Hello there, welcome back to yet another video where I'll be talking about this pretty cool paper that's titled as Modeling Relational Data with Graph Convolutional Networks. And it's from researchers from University of Amsterdam, VU Amsterdam, and Cypher. So before we start with the paper, I have a couple of quick announcements to make. So I'm starting off with the email subscription service where you'll receive one email per month and that too particularly on 3rd with the links to all the videos that I've published so far for the previous month. So in case you miss out on any videos for whatsoever reason at the time of release, you can now be assured to get it delivered right into your inbox. That's pretty cool, right? Already we have good number of people signed up for this subscription, so make sure to get yours as well. I've put the sign up link in the description box, make sure to check it out. Cool, enough said, let's begin. So this is another work that came around in the time of GCN that extends the previously related techniques to GCN in applying it to relational graph data like knowledge graphs. So if you can recall it, then GCN, GraphSage and all of these papers talked about learning representation of different components of the graphs such as nodes and edges for the graphs that have just single type of nodes and single types of edges. Whereas in this paper, authors work toward generalizing it to graphs that have multiple types of nodes and multiple types of edges or relations. For example, what you commonly see in knowledge graphs. So if you see this figure, you can see that we have set of nodes and set of edges where edges are nothing but the relationship between any two nodes. So clearly you can see like different types of edges, right? You have a relation that says awarded, then educated at, then citizen of. And similarly, there are properties or different entities associated with the type of nodes that you also have. For example, this is of country type, this is university, this is award, and this is valid answer. So yeah, this is what I was talking about. This is what exactly a knowledge graph looks like. And also you can see like you have these directed edges, which kind of say like this was awarded, this award then this educated at this university. So this is kind of the relation that we're trying to infer from such graphs. So there are many such freely available knowledge graphs that are available to the public, such as Yago, DBpedia and Wikidata and Freebase and so on. So as the author says, like despite the great effort invested in the creation and maintenance of such large graphs, these still remain incomplete in some sense. And two such standard knowledge base completion tasks are link prediction, where you try to find the relation that might not exist between any two current nodes and then entity classification, which is about giving identity to any particular node. So for example, if you see this figure again, the red color markings that you see over here are supposed to be predicted by us, which were missing in the original graph. We already had a node say country. So this is what we want our system to predict as in this node relates to the node of country with the relation type of citizen of, and also based on the other relations that this node has, we want to predict like this is the identity of that node. So yeah, these are the tasks that we want to work on. So clearly the previous approaches such as GCN and GraphSage don't really scale to such graphs. So for that purpose only, this paper introduces a concept of relation into the graph convolution networks. So let's see through the equation. So if you see this forward pass equation, you can clearly recall, I guess, if you have followed my previous two videos, which were about graph attention networks and GraphSage, the idea is pretty much similar with an extra addition of this summation term. So let's decode this equation first. So the hidden representation of the ith node, which is a central one at L plus one th layer is nothing but derived from the value that you already have in the previous layer. That's why the superscript of L what you see. Okay, so we understand this much, right? Now, if I remove this summation term, I remove this R, I remove this R over here. Now, can you recall this equation? So if you don't talk about the specifics around the aggregation functions, so this is exactly what GCN and GraphSage do, right? You take the hidden representation of the neighbors where J is nothing but all the neighbors of I. For every layer, you define a weight matrix that is shared by all the neighbors for that layer. You do the linear transformation. You sum it over for all the neighbors that you have, and then you normalize it. Okay, so this R also has to be removed. So this one by CI is nothing but the normalization constant that they have also written, which can be learned or chosen in advance, which is nothing but the degree of the node I. So once you have done aggregation and summing up the results from all the neighboring nodes, you add up the information from this node itself from the previous layer, what it had. Do a separate transformation for this. So this is not exactly same as the transformation that you do for the neighboring nodes. So again, the basic intuition behind this is that the previous representation of the same central node might have more contribution compared to just the neighboring nodes when it comes to identifying its representation at L plus one th layer. So that's why we give this liberty and we learn this matrix separately. So once this internal equation is solved, 
we pass it through a nonlinear function and get the representation of the central node i for the next layer. So this much we understand, correct? So now let me clean this scribble and talk about the equation for the relational part. Okay, so now this summation, what do you see over here, right? So this is nothing but it iterates over all the possible set of relations that you might have at certain level L. So let's say if I pick R1, which is one type of relation, for example, it's a is underscore A relation. Then for all the neighbors that I has in the Lth level, how many of them have this relation is a? You do a summation of that. So which means all the relations in a particular layer have a shared weight matrix. Unlike the previous part where you had the entire layer had the same transformation matrix. Here you have a transformation matrix for every type of connection that you have in that particular layer. So that's why the subscript R. And then again, the normalization factor also updates. Now it's not vanilla in degree for that central node, but the in degrees that come from that relation essentially. So yeah, that's the major update that I was talking about that kind of converts your previous works into its relational format. Now in the similar way, you can talk about adding attention weights as well while keeping these relation. So you'll have relational graph attention networks and this T2 term still remains unchanged. I think now you must have gotten the idea to how the relational aspect comes into the picture. Okay. So one of the issues that you'll find with that equation is that we'll now need to learn a lot of matrices, right? Because we have matrix at every level and that too now for every relation. So for example, if we have, let's say L equal to three, if we had three layers and each layer initially used to have their own W, W1, W2, W3, let's say superscript represents the number of layers. And let's say each of these layers now have hundred relations, which again, I feel is a pretty decent assumption because these real life knowledge graphs will have hundreds to thousands of unique relations. So which means now every layer over here itself is learning hundred matrices. 100 over here, 100 over here. So the number of parameters now you're essentially learning has increased drastically. So with this again, the two problems that you can face, first is the overfitting. And the second one being like, now it will take more time to train these models because of the larger number of parameters that you need to estimate. So to address this, authors propose two techniques. One is the basis learning, another is block diagonal decomposition. So let's talk about the basis decomposition. So let's say we want to estimate the weight matrix for the layer L for a certain relation R. So we decompose it as a linear combination of the basis matrix weighted by an importance coefficient. So let's say we have capital B number of basis matrices, which is shared in a particular layer. Then you have this importance term that's dependent on R, which essentially learns an importance parameter for that relation to how important that particular basis matrix is for that relation. And once you sum it over an entire B set of matrix, you'll get the final weight matrix for the relation R at the level L. And now essentially the learning that you have to do is to learn these importance parameter, which again is a scalar value. Okay. So now talking about the second method, which is block diagonal decomposition. Okay. So here the idea is for every weight matrix that you need to learn for every level and for every relation, you represent it as a block diagonal matrix. So for example, if this was the matrix that you had, let's say it's four cross four, four, one, two, three, four. Okay. So yeah, this is the matrix that you need to have. So instead of learning all the 16 values over here, you can divide it into diagonal block matrix, such as this one and this one. So this is exactly what they have written. Like you can have capital B number of such matrix. And this way you kind of enforce to just learn these values and keep everything as zeros, which is again a way of enforcing sparsity while learning this W matrix. So now the number of parameters that you need to estimate are pretty less, which is nothing but 16 by two, which is eight. So the number of parameters essentially divide by the number of blocks that you make. And finally, you define it as a direct sum over all these matrix that you have learned by which they try to reduce the overfitting scenario. Okay. So yeah, talking about the two use cases that they worked, which is the entity classification and the link prediction. So the node classification is a pretty standard task. It's just like any other classification task that you would do. Once you get the representation, depending on the number of classes you have, you can choose to have final layer as softmax or sigmoid. So again, the representation for every node is based on the RGCN model that we have just seen. And once you get that, you can stack a softmax activation on the output of the last layer to get the probability to get the probability across the possible number of classes on which then you can perform cross entropy loss, which is written over here. So yeah, that's pretty standard talking about the link prediction task. So under link prediction, the idea is to kind of complete a triple where let's say you have node one and you have node two, and this is the subject. This is the object. 
you want to know whether there is a relation that connects these two nodes or not so that is the task that we are talking about so to train this model they essentially first get the node embeddings using the rgcn model and you'll get some representation for this which will be of d dimension you'll get some representation of this which again will be of d dimension you need to pass them through a function so that it returns a scalar value which is nothing but a score of you attaching an edge over there or not so you might have already guessed by now the task is essentially to say whether an edge will be there or not which means a binary classification problem which means the final activation is supposed to be sigmoid so the representation that we pass for let's say subject and then for object after the sigmoid should give me a value close to 1 if the ground truth was 1 or this value should be giving the probability near to 0 in case the ground truth was also 0 so now the question is how do we generate this training set of negative and positive samples so for positive sample we already have the ground truth labels because we have the base knowledge graph where we know what connections are so let's say if this was one of the graphs that we had and this is the fourth node that goes like this so let's say this was the knowledge graph that we had so to create a positive sample i'll remove this edge and now this node let's say a and b become my input with the ground truth table of 1 because i already know there was an edge and i had deleted it to make it a training set so this way you kind of generate your positive samples and again not just one over here since we are trying to predict the type of relation so essentially that one hot vector of one at that position what the type of that relation is cool and then to create a negative samples you can pick either the head or the tail and associate that with any of the other nodes where the relation is not r1 for example if this was r1 so that way you essentially create the negative samples and they have particularly mentioned like for every positive sample they create w negative ones and again based on the random corruption of either the subject or the object and then you have a normalized cross entropy loss so yeah i think now we are done with the paper so if you enjoyed this content make sure to hit that like button and also subscribe to the channel and share it across with your friends to whosoever is interested in such content i'll meet you in the next one bye bye and take care